three. Boa tarde, bem-vindos e bem-vindas ao colóquio de hoje do Instituto de Física da USP. Eu vou fazer a apresentação em inglês, porque o nosso palestrante de hoje ainda não fala português. Talvez em algum momento ele fale. So, welcome to the Physics Colloquium. It's a really great pleasure to have today Dr. Avik Dutt, um, currently at Stanford University, um, but very soon at the University of Maryland in College Park. Uh, Avik um, received a bachelor's degree from the Indian Institute of Technology uh, in Karagpur, if I'm not wrong in the pronunciation, in 2011, and a PhD in electrical and computer engineering from Cornell University. Um, I was very fortunate to meet him uh, at Cornell University when I was on sabbatical in Michal Lipson's group. Um, we worked together, so that was in 2012. And um, uh, it has been ever since a huge pleasure to interact with Avik, to follow um, the great science that he's been doing, um, what he did in his PhD, but also since he's been um, in St at Stanford University um, with Shan Hui Fan, he's going to talk to us about this. It's a whole new playground um, to study very interesting um, features as topological properties, quantum Hall effects um, simulated in um, photonic structures. Uh, one of the things that I want to say, so uh, again, Avik will, will join the University of Maryland in College Park um, as a faculty assistant professor in January next year. And one of the things that I would like to highlight about him, which, which is a reason, you know, one of the reasons why uh, Michal Lipson is so successful is that she attracts very talented and hardworking students. And um, Avik is one of the examples of those students who follow to the letter a uh, recommendation by the late Asher Perez. If you want to be successful, you should work 24 hours a day. And if that's not enough, you should work at night too. And Avik is, is one who has really always amazed me with his, his capability of doing that. So thank you very much for accepting Avik. It's... Uh, um, kind of half past midnight where he is currently he's spending a little uh, some time in India um, and so he's talking directly from India to us and it's uh, again an example of how he can endure working uh, late at night thank you Avik please um, thank you so much Paulo for uh, the warmest introduction I guess I've ever gotten And uh, it's really a pleasure and honor to be able to discuss some of my recent work at this colloquium in the Institute of Physics uh, at USP. I've uh, always wanted to visit uh, University of Sao Paulo in Brazil at some point, but since uh, this is the closest I've gotten uh, to that, it's really I'm really looking forward to this interaction. And uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to stop at any point, I'm happy to make it more engaging rather than leave questions to the end. So uh, that's what I would like to start with. Um, so I hope I can do justice to what uh, introduction Paulo provided uh, before I dive into the work. And what I hope to convince you by the end of this talk is uh, how can we use the amazing internal properties of photons, this frequency, spin, and temporal mode structure that we have at our disposal to create very simple structures to explore higher dimensional physics or uh, emulate condensed matter phenomena that otherwise might either be difficult or impossible to realize or could require quite complicated structures, uh, low temperatures or high magnetic fields and so on. Uh, so, but before I start with that, I'd like to uh, take a step back and ask, why do we want to use photonics in the first place? Since this is a general physics colloquium, I thought it wouldn't hurt to spend uh, 
a slide on that. And one of the reasons is that uh, Photonics has evolved to become a very low loss platform for connecting and networking. And this is exemplified by uh, long distance telecommunication where optical fibers have really pushed the loss down to um, 0.2 dB per kilometer. And more recently in the chip scale, uh, we've seen losses of the order of single dB per meter. And even five or 10 years ago, we were looking at something to the tune of a dB per centimeter. So this kind of uh, reduction in noise is really, uh, or sorry, reduction in loss is really what's enabled a leaps and bounds improvement in photonic technologies. Uh, and for CMOS photonic foundries have come up where you can just send designs and get chips in a few months. Uh, but also uh, since optical photons have much larger energies than the thermal excitations at room temperature, they are more robust or uh, can withstand room temperature noise without completely decohering or getting lost in noise. But that is not to say that photonics is without its challenges compared to other platforms. Uh, photons are very weakly interacting and uh, they're in fact, to a very good approximation, non-interacting bosons. But apart from that, uh, another uh, challenge that is ubiquitous, not only in photonics, but other platforms is that of scalability. And I'm showing you some examples from recent years where for different quantum as well as uh, classical applications, we've seen that the number of components that are either in free space setups or integrated on chip have grown into the tens to hundreds or even thousands range. And when I uh, say scalability, I'm not uh, just saying that the spatial footprint that these components uh, take up is increasing. It is also that the number of electrical, optical, uh, or input output signals needed to control uh, or provide input and read the, uh, uh, the detection side has become prohibitively large. And this also leads to a lot of loss in power consumption. Um, so the reason behind all this, I feel, is because we are used to thinking of the propagation of photons in spatial degrees of freedom, such as x, y, and z, or length, breadth, and height. Uh, the, uh, I believe that if we can start to think of the propagation of photons in alternate degrees of freedom, such as frequency, uh, time, or spin, polarization, then we can overcome some of these challenges. And this also paves the way for fundamental studies uh, to emulate condensed matter or high energy or any other kinds of physical phenomena where there's a lot of richness in higher dimensional models beyond 3D because uh, in our traditional X, Y, and Z dimensions, we might have a tough time going to four, five, or six dimensions. Um, and as an example of uh, what kind of interesting physics that uh, might exist in higher dimensions, I want to just take the one of the mantras of topology, and I'll briefly touch upon what I mean by topology later in the talk, but in general, higher the dimensions, richer is the topology. Um, and the prototypical example for electrons is the 2D quantum Hall effect. Uh, but here we also have something that is the 4D quantum Hall effect, which is a nonlinear response instead of the linear 2D response. Um, or uh, we can look at higher order topological insulators and these all exemplify uh, a lot of new phases that show up, which do not have any lower dimensional analog. Uh, but even if we take a step back and look at uh, completely 2D uh, topological photonics, what has been uh, usually done to realize these structures in real space uh, is that we have uh, an array of tens to hundreds of these ring resonators or wave guides that are coupled and connected in a very precise way. And then we apply signals to realize these kinds of phases of the coupling that we need or uh, the kinds of input and output that we need to measure to realize these structures. The question I want to ask is, uh, can we get away with much simpler structures? Uh, instead of tens to hundreds of rings, how far can we push this? Can we get essentially the same physics in a single ring resonator? And the answer is yes. We can do this because photons, which are the particles of light or the electromagnetic field are a very versatile uh, particle with many internal and external degrees of freedom. They have frequency and temporal mode structure the field has amplitude and phase and uh, polarization. But using additional spatial structure, we can also imprint transverse spatial mode structure or orbital angular momentum 
and use these as additional ways of encoding information or of uh, thinking of them as extra dimensions along which photons can propagate as long as they're orthogonal. And over the years, uh, we've been using several of these uh, degrees of freedom for uh, quantum photonics or nonlinear optics and spectroscopy in my graduate school work. And more recently in my postdoctoral work, uh, we've been looking at topological physics in synthetic dimensions, which is what I'll be focusing in today's talk. Uh, but the enabling device that has made all of this possible is the use of very high quality factor ring resonators. And by high quality factor, I mean uh, quality factors exceeding a million in several of our cases. Um, but uh, how do these structures work? A uh, ring resonator is essentially a dielectric waveguide that's wrapped onto itself and evanescently coupled to a bus waveguide. So when an integer number of uh, wavelengths uh, fit inside the circumference of this ring um, and we have low enough loss, we see resonant enhancement as you can see in this top view infrared camera image. Um, and uh, we can realize them in several platforms such as silicon nitride and uh, even in fiber ring resonators. This is, these are nanofabricated micro ring resonators. These are uh, meter scale fiber ring resonators that we've been working on. And uh, just to provide a brief summary before going to the details, uh, we can look at very different uh, physics in uh, the same ring resonator system, depending on uh, whether they are nonlinear and static, uh, which was again the focus of my graduate school work, or whether they are uh, linear or nonlinear, but time bearing, which is what we have been uh, focusing more recently to realize a wide variety of physical phenomena. So, without uh, more delay, uh, I'll come to the outline where I'll be discussing the concept and background behind uh, the synthetic dimensions and topology. And then I'll come to uh, an experimental band structure measurement technique uh, to characterize these kinds of uh, synthetic dimensions. And we'll use this band structure measurement technique to study Hermitian topology in uh, synthetic hull ladders, as well as non-Hermitian topology. And if time permits, I'll go towards some more applications that are uh, useful for these concepts of fundamental physics to get transferred to technologies. Um, so to explain what I mean by the synthetic dimension, I'd like to take the help of this figure here where let's say we have a 2D array of pillars, each of which has a different height. We can represent the same uh, structure with the help of a completely planar 2D array of dots where the third dimension height is now encoded in the form of a color or frequency. And this color or frequency now plays the role of a synthetic dimension. Uh, encoding a 3D physics in a 2D representation. And this can be any internal degree of freedom such as spin, polarization, mode number, frequency, or temporal mode structure. And what it allows us to do is to uh, represent higher dimensional physics on lower dimensional geometries, which are much easier to fabricate or drastically reduce experimental complexity, not only for creating, but also for probing them. Um, and because in synthetic dimensions, the connectivity between elements is not based on the, how close they are in physical space, but how they are connected through these internal degrees of freedom, we can get long range coupling and reconfigure connectivity very easily. Uh, now, in photonics or optics, this concept is not really new. Uh, we know of wavelength division multiplexing for quite some time. Um, then what, what, what is different here? I would say two things. One is that uh, the term synthetic dimension really originated in cold atoms where the spin state of atoms was used as a, a synthetic dimension to study topology or these quantum Hall effects. And the second thing is in wavelength division multiplexing, usually we think of each wavelength or frequency as an independent channel and we do not want interference between them. Whereas here, what we will really be looking at is how to coherently mix or combine these different frequency components and intentionally cause interference to realize uh, connected lattices and geometries. Uh, now, to create the synthetic dimension, we need two ingredients. One is the set of states along which the photons can live or hop between. And the second is a way of connecting these states. Um, and this set of states that we choose is the equidistant frequency modes of a dielectric ring resonator 
which is separated by the free spectral range, which is nothing but the time it takes light to go around once in the ring. And in a static ring, in the absence of any uh, modulation or coupling, all these modes are orthogonal and uncoupled to each other. Now, if we introduce a perturbation to a small section of the ring that breaks the rotational symmetry of this uh, resonator, and we drive it at a frequency that matches the mode spacing or the FSR, then we can couple these adjacent modes to form a 1D tight binding lattice with nearest neighbor coupling along the synthetic frequency dimension. And uh, an advantage of uh, frequency dimension is that uh, we can actually get more than 100 modes that are coupled pretty uniformly with a single modulator signal, which is quite different from the initial experiments in cold atoms where only three or four states of spins could be coupled. Um, now, this was using, let's say, electro-optic modulation uh, based on uh, a Pockel's effect such as lithium niobate, but we don't need to be restricted to that. We can use any other modalities such as acoustic or MEMS-based modulators or, or even non-photonic platforms to get uh, the kind of coupling we need to create this frequency synthetic dimension depending on what modulation speed index and lattice spacing we have access to and how many modes we want to couple. Uh, now looking at the transfer function of the electro-optic modulator in a bit more detail, um, we can expand it in form of Bessel functions. And we see that now if we come in with uh, of light at a frequency omega naught, it creates these side bands. Uh, perhaps more importantly, the phase of this modulation, if you just look at this expansion, is imprinted on the sideband. So the upward going modulation has a phase of phi, whereas the downward going modulation has a phase of minus phi. And this realizes a 1D lattice in a zero dimensional system. I'm calling it zero dimensional because we have a single ring resonator, not an array of ring resonators. Uh, now, if we extend this to a 1D a real space array of ring resonators, each of which is modulated at the same frequency of the FSR and uh, evanescently coupled to one another, but at a different phase, phi, two phi, three phi, and so on, then we can write uh, the same equivalent lattice in the form of one axis, which is the frequency dimension along Y, and the other axis is the real space dimension, which is here shown by Z. Um, and what we have here is real couplings in one direction and complex couplings with a linearly varying phase in the other dimension. And if you look at it a bit more closely, we'll see that this is identical to the Hamiltonian of an electron confined to a 2D lattice when subjected to a perpendicular magnetic field. Or, or in short, that is the harper hofstadter Hamiltonian in the Landau gate. So what we've done here is quite interesting. We've taken a photon, which is a neutral particle, which does not respond to magnetic field. And just by tuning the couplings and their phases in the right way, we've been able to realize an effective magnetic field for the photon in this hybrid real and synthetic space. Uh, now, if we go ahead and look at the band structure of such a system, we'll see a bulk bands, which are shown in blue, which are separated by these band gaps traversed by uh, these topologically protected uh, edge modes. And these edge modes shown in red are one way or chiral in nature. Uh, and they're protected topologically because of a certain invariant called the churn number, which can be defined in terms of the wave functions of these bulk bands. So as long as the perturbations do not close this band gap, these uh, modes are protected against backscattering or disorder. Um, and we can, uh, again, come in with a light, let's say, at the leftmost ring resonator. And uh, we, at the right energy it will, or frequency, it will go up in this uh, leftmost ring resonator till it hits the edge and frequency space, at which point it has no option but to turn right because there's no mode that's going in the counterclockwise direction at this uh, detuning or frequency. Uh, and continue in the highest frequency in the, all the rings till it hits the edge in real space. And in this way, it keeps on going in a clockwise direction. Now that is more or less what I wanted to discuss on uh, the theory aspect. Uh, but 
a question we wanted to answer is what does it mean to have a band structure in uh, such a synthetic frequency dimension? And we know that the band structure plays a very important role in electronic systems where it determines whether a material is a metal or an insulator and in photonic systems where it determines whether certain frequencies are allowed to propagate in the system or they're blocked from propagating the system. And uh, from our undergraduate solid state 101 class, we know that uh, any periodic system can be associated with a band structure based on Bloch's theorem. Um, and this band structure is also important for uh, calculating or determining the topology of the system. Uh, in our frequency dimension, uh, we can uh, take the Fourier transform of this Hamiltonian by going into the uh, block quasi momentum space. And that diagonalizes this Hamiltonian uh, to form cosine band structure. And the width of this cosine is proportional to the strength of the coupling between these nearest neighbors. But what does it mean to have this wave vector or block quasi momentum in the frequency dimension? Going uh, ahead with the analogy with real space, uh, since our lattice space is in frequency, the reciprocal space is nothing but conjugate to frequency, so that's time itself. And this time is now periodic in two pi over this lattice spacing. Uh, and that turns out to be exactly the round trip time. This means that we have a one to one correspondence between the block quasi momentum K or the wave vector and the time T in units of the round trip time. And this led to the interesting possibility that if we now excite this modulated ring resonator with a wave guide um, at the input and then collect the time result transmission at the output at time scales that are faster than the round trip time of the ring, uh, then we can indeed uh, observe the band structure as we scan the uh, frequency of the input laser and observe the peaks in the time result transmission. This is a Floquet simulation that matches very well with the theoretically expected band structure. So we went ahead and um, built this uh, setup using a fiber cavity with a length of around 13 and a half meters corresponding to free, uh, an FSR of around 15 megahertz. Um, we used a lithium niobate fiber picted electro optic modulator and a detection system with a bandwidth of more than one gigahertz so that we have many of the 15 megahertz separated uh, free spectral range modes within this one gigahertz uh, bandwidth. And we are very excited to see that the experimentally measured band structure matches quite well with the cosine bands that we expect on theory. And I'll walk you through this video here. Uh, so let's see. Uh, on the x axis, I'm showing the time in normalized units in the first Brillouin zone or in real units on the right. Um, and on the y axis, we have the detuning of the input laser from the uh, resonance frequency of one of the modes. And you'll see that as the detuning scans across uh, the resonances or the band structure, we only see peaks in the time result transmission when the detuning is within one of the bands. And when it's outside one of the bands, uh, we do not see any peak. And so the, by stacking all these time traces one on top of the other, we can completely recreate the band structure. And in some sense, this is a photonic analog of uh, RPS, which is the gold standard of measuring band structures in condensed matter experiments, uh, but in our case, in frequency lattices in a much simpler system at room temperature. A big advantage of synthetic dimensions is that we can tune the uh, coupling strength almost at will. So here I'm showing you an example where we are going from completely flat bands when there's no voltage applied to the modulator to very strongly coupled modes with uh, wide bands, that is, uh, whose bandwidth exceeds the spacing themselves, uh, resulting in a uh, very strong coupling uh, in these kinds of systems. Now, all of this was done using a fast photodiode. If we replace it with a slow photodiode, then the time result or k result information gets integrated out. And what we end up is not the band structure, but the density of states. And this is nothing but a Lorentzian for the static modes of the resonator. Um, and in the case of uh, nearest neighbor coupled model, uh, we see in 1D the band structure, sorry, the density of states is shown by this 
uh, blue uh, line here, which matches pretty well with the red dashed line uh, based on theoretical expectations. And these small peaks we see at the edges of the band are the band Hove singularities that are slightly uh, washed out by the loss rate in the ring. So all of this matches our expectations pretty well. Uh, but another advantage of synthetic dimension is that we can go beyond nearest neighbor coupling just by adding uh, additional modulation frequencies as integer multiples of the nearest neighbor uh, mode spacing. So here we are showing an example of adding a uh, second harmonic modulation still within the same modulator and using just an arbitrary waveform generator, if we can generate this signal and put it on the modulator, that's all uh, that we need to do to get this change in the lattice structure. And uh, even more importantly, we can control the phase of the longer range coupling to the nearest neighbor coupling. And this phase now gets imprinted on uh, the modulation. So the upward going arrow has a phase of phi, whereas the downward going arrow has a phase of minus phi. And we can now reconfigure this in the form of a triangular array of clickets. If you see both of these are identical structures, which are now threaded by alternating magnetic fluxes. Now we went ahead and measured this band structure, which matches again well with theory. Uh, but what's interesting here is that the positive K bands and the negative K bands are asymmetric which means that this system for phi equals pi over 2 breaks time reversal symmetry and can be used for non-reciprocal frequency conversion or unidirectional frequency conversion. And again, when we go to phi equals pi, the band structure becomes symmetric and we uh, lose the non-reciprocity. Now, till now, I've only been talking about one-dimensional systems, uh, but for several of the uh, Several of the ideas I've been mentioning before, such as realizing effective magnetic fields or topology, we want to go beyond one dimension. But can we still keep doing that within a single ring? Uh, and for that, we decided to use another degree of freedom that the photon has within the ring resonator, which is the direction of propagation. Um, so we can use the clockwise and counterclockwise modes as two pseudo spins within the same ring resonator. The clockwise modes are represented by the uh, blue dots and the counterclockwise modes are represented by the red dots. And each of these independent uh, legs of the ladder are uh, coupled by an electro-optic modulator, just like I was describing before. Now to form the rungs of the ladder, once we have the legs, uh, we insert this figure of eight coupler. Uh, let's see what it does uh, very carefully. If you follow the path of a clockwise photon, it goes into this blue arm, and then comes out as a counterclockwise photon. So that's shown by the left to right blue arrow here. If you follow the path of a clock counterclockwise photon, it goes into the pink dashed arm and comes out as a clockwise photon. So that's shown by the right to left pink uh, arrow here. Uh, perhaps more importantly, we can make the lengths of the blue and the pink arms different. So we have a different phase going from left to right versus right to left. And this phase now becomes dependent on frequency for a fixed arm length difference because the phase acquired will be proportional to what frequency mode we are sitting on. So what we've done here is we've automatically realized a magnetic field with just a single modulator instead of using a real space array of rings uh, because uh, we have real couplings along one dimension and uh, complex valued uh, couplings with a phase that's linearly ramping along the other dimension. Now, these uh, quantum hall ladders have been realized before in photonics, but usually they would require again tens to hundreds of these ring resonators, but we can do it with a single ring resonator because we are using now simultaneously two of these internal degrees of freedom, frequency and pseudo spin. And if you compare with previous work on hall ladders, which has mostly been in cold atoms, uh, using either bosons or fermions in real and synthetic dimensions, uh, we were sort of unique in that uh, we could do the same thing without recourse to any real space dimensions because all of these had usually one real and one synthetic dimension. Uh, looking at quantum hall systems in a bit more detail, um, we usually know that they have uh, extended number of sites along both X and Y dimensions. Um, and they would have these bulk bands, which are shown in light blue. 
separated by the band gaps. And what determines the topology of these bulk bands is uh, at an integer invariant called the churn number, uh, which depends on the wave functions, uh, Berry curvature. And uh, in, in colloquial terms, what it counts is the number of times a wave fun a, a complex valued wave function would wind in phase as we go around the Brillouin zone. And uh, this churn number also determines the number of edge states that exist within each band gap, which is called the bulk edge correspondence. But uh, for to keep in mind later, I just want to emphasize that the topology is determined by the complex uh, wave functions uh, and not the energies themselves. And what we have in our systems is in our uh, quantum hull ladder is not uh, an extended number of sites in X, but just two sites along X. Um, so do we still expect the same physics? What we are doing here is a very drastic perturbation. We are getting rid of all the bulk sites and keeping sort of only the edges. Um, and the remarkable uh, answer is that we indeed see the signatures of the quantum Hall effect or topology still exist. Even though we've made such a drastic perturbation to the system, all the bulk mo modes are gone, but the edge modes still remain. And this attests to the remarkable topological protection of the parent quantum Hall state. Now we wanted to test this in experiments. So we modified our setup to add an additional figure of eight loop in using fibers. Um, and we can also do spin and momentum resolved measurements because the momentum result resolution is provided by the time resolution in um, our band structure spectroscopy. Whereas the spin resolution is provided by the fact that we can excite from the left onto the clockwise mode and measure on the right uh, to get the clockwise pseudo spin projected band structure. And we can do the opposite for the counterclockwise spin projected band structure. And we're very pleased to see that in our experiments, the measured bands agree very well with the theoretically uh, predicted bands, as well as with Floquet simulations. We, in these bands, we see a phenomenon which is called spin momentum locking. So for the moment, let's just focus on the lower band. We'll see that the positive K bands are primarily localized on the clockwise pseudo spin, whereas the negative K bands are localized on the counterclockwise pseudo spin. And this one-to-one -one correspondence between the spin and momentum of the bands is called uh, spin momentum locking. Uh, now, uh, why is this arising? Is because uh, if you look at the Hamiltonian K space, uh, it has a coupling between the spin degree of freedom and a momentum dependent effective magnetic field, which causes the spin orbit coupling in this uh, effective system. Uh, using the tunability in our lattices, we can control a phase transition uh, by just controlling the voltage on the electro-optic modulator to go from a regime where the horizontal coupling is much stronger than the vertical coupling. And we have nearly flat bands with no chirality or uh, asymmetry or spin momentum locking to a regime where the vertical coupling is much stronger than the horizontal coupling. And we have very strong asymmetry and spin momentum locking. And this kind of a phase transition from a single K minimum to two K minima has been called a Meissner phase to a vortex phase transition in cold atoms or in superconducting systems. And we are able to emulate that again in our uh, frequency and spin quantum hull ladder lattice. Now, all of this was done using um, reciprocal space measurements. Uh, if we want to also measure in lattice space, uh, we are able to measure chiral currents and chiral currents in our system means that if we come in from the left leg of the ladder, we go up in frequency, whereas if we come in from the right leg of the ladder, we go down in frequency for a certain band. And hence we can define a chiral current, which is the asymmetry between the upward excited modes and the downward excited modes. And to measure this in experiments, we add uh, an acoustoptic modulator, uh, which frequency shifts a part of the input laser and then heterodyne beats it with the output of the cavity followed by spectral analysis. And you'll see in this uh, simulation that if we excite the left mode of the ladder, we indeed uh, see propagation upwards in frequency. 
And we were actually quite excited to see that uh, such an asymmetry shows up in experiments where the higher frequency modes are much more popular than the lower frequency modes, let's say for a certain value of the, or certain sign of the magnetic field at this energy. And then if you go to the opposite magnetic field by changing the arm lengths and adjusting the phases, we can see a stronger population of the lower frequency modes. So we're seeing all the signatures that we would expect for um, such a quantum Hull ladder. Now that is pretty much what I want to talk on Hermitian topology in this talk. Uh, but beyond reproducing what we see in uh, condensed matter uh, experiments or in other systems, we also want to observe new physics that are very difficult to observe or uh, in fact have not been observed in other systems. Um, and this is what got us excited to study non-Hermitian topology. Um, and the unique feature of non-Hermitian topology is that uh, because if a Hamiltonian that is non-Hermitian can have complex eigenvalues, these eigenvalues or the energies themselves can have a topological nature because they can wind around in uh, a non-trivial way in the complex energy plane. Uh, and uh, to realize these kinds of bindings, uh, what we need is something slightly different from what we mean by non-Hermitian physics in in the usual sense, uh, a lot of the previous work has been on realizing gain and loss in any of these systems to realize either lasers or uh, parity time symmetry. But to realize non Hermitian topology, what we need is not just on site gain and loss, but we need non hermeticity in the couplings, which means that if we let's say have a Hamiltonian of this form, uh, then the coupling from n to n plus m will not be the complex conjugate of the coupling from n plus m to n. And these uh, have to be different in amplitude, not just in the complex conjugation of the phase. Uh, and uh, these are, so what we really uh, want is something that is quite unusual. If we have, think of two resonators that are coupled to each other, we want resonator A to couple to resonator B with a different strength than resonator B to couple to resonator A. Uh, but it turns out that in, um, in our frequency dimension system, this is quite simple. In addition to having a phase modulation, which changes the real part of the refractive index, if you also have an amplitude modulation, which changes the uh, imaginary part of the refractive index, uh, then we can write down the coupled amplitude equations for the real part would look something of this form, which is quite familiar. But for the imaginary, uh, part modulation of the index, we would have another coupled amplitude equation, which looks, uh, which is proportional to the strength of the amplitude modulation delta. And just like in the case of phase modulation, the uh, phase difference between the phase modulation and the amplitude modulation also enters into the coupled mode equations. So if we make the phase modulation and the amplitude modulation in quadrature, so they are pi by two out of phase, we can get a asymmetric amplitude coupling between left to right versus right to left. So uh, I want to emphasize that this is asymmetric in the strength of the coupling, not just in the phase of the coupling. And that's what is needed for non hermitian topology. Um, and then if we write down the K space uh, energy um, evolution of the system, as we go from K equals zero to K equals two pi, we'll see that it traces a circle in the complex plane uh, with this complex uh, real and uh, imaginary energy plane. And this circle now can be identified with a non-trivial winding based on the Cauchy controlled integral formula. Now, if we now ch uh, change this theta to zero so that the phase modulation and the amplitude modulation are in phase, it would not enclose an area and it would just retrace its path back and forth as we go from k equals zero to k equals two pi. So this is a completely trivial winding. Uh, we can also introduce longer range non hermitian coupling uh, to get uh, winding numbers that are more than one. So here we are showing a region which has a winding number of minus two with respect to a reference energy epsilon that is sitting inside this winding, inside this uh, part of the complex energy plane. 
Now, it's interesting to see these windings. Uh, these, these are still at the theory stage that I'm showing you here, and I'll show you experiments in the next couple of slides. But uh, the other reason why this kind of non ramsian topology has been interesting to uh, condensed matter theorists or uh, other branches of physics has been uh, new physical effects, such as the non hermitian skin effect and the breakdown of what we usually understand as bulk uh, edge correspondence. Uh, and since these uh, topologies determine in terms of the eigen energy, not the wave function or eigenstate as in Hermitian topology, uh, once this bulk edge correspondence breaks down, we'll see that uh, a macroscopic fraction of the eigenstates are localized on the edge, not just one or two or three, as we see in the Hermitian topology case. Um, and this provides ways to create very directional uh, transfer of energy or power in such non hermitian systems. Uh, now, the way we realized these kinds of windings for the first time in our experiments was we extended the same band structure spectroscopy uh, technique uh, to a way where we could not only map out the real part of the energy, but also the imaginary part of the energy at each value of k or equivalently time in our system. Um, and for that, we fit the position as well as the width of the Lorentzian as we take vertical cuts through the uh, detuning scans. And you can see that for two different k's, not only are the positions in the energy axis different, but also the widths of the resonances. And by mapping this out throughout uh, the first Brillouin zone going from k equals zero to two pi, we can uh, recreate the loop that is created by a specific uh, amplitude and phase modulation. Uh, we can also introduce long range couplings and in experiments we saw uh, almost all the Lisa who figures that we are used to in let's say, uh, beating and interference experiments uh, from high school physics. Uh, but we also observe the higher winding numbers, which are, again, not very simple to observe in real space systems or in any other platform. And we observed a winding number of minus two. Um, and we are still looking at ways of going beyond this. So this is all still scratching the surface. And what we would like to do is extend it to more than one band or mo more dimensions to see uh, what kind of interactions exist between non hermitian bands, uh, number of dimensions, and nonlinearity in our system. Uh, now, this has been still mostly looking at uh, how we can use the concept of synthetic dimensions for very interesting physics, very phys uh, interesting physics investigations. Uh, but moving slightly towards applications, uh, I want to think about how can we use this for more scalable or more compact implementations of unit trans unitary transformations for uh, photons in quantum or classical circuits. Um, so one of the ways to do that is to first go back to how linear transformations for photons are done today in, in one of the typical ways. Uh, a typical way is to encode the input vector of complex amplitudes in, let's say, a neural network or any quantum information processing system into the amplitudes of the uh, N waveguide input modes. And then we operate on it with a mark center interferometer mesh, which is controlled by uh, phase shifters or uh, thermal heater elements. Now, the problem with this approach is that uh, it requires n squared spatial footprint and n squared number of controls approximately of the order of n squared for an n by n uh, unitary matrix uh, implementation, be it for quantum circuits or matrix vector multiplications. Uh, what we wanted to see if there's a way to reduce this number of control and spatial footprint requirement and for that, if we encode the input complex vector uh, in the amplitudes of the frequency modes uh, to the input of a bus waveguide, and instead of using n squared uh, elements, we can just use n rings of the order of n rings, which are then controlled by n uh, independent time uh, dependent signals. We can create the same amount of complexity and same number of arbitrary linear transformations, but with uh, much more scalable implementations. 
So this is a theory work in which we showed that um, if you have a target matrix, we can realize this target matrix with just one ring with pretty high fidelity. And with four rings, we can get almost arbitrary precision since this is a five by five matrix. Um, if we can inverse design uh, the signals that we need to put on each of these uh, modulators, uh, and what it essentially is doing is it's transferring the fabrication complexity to create that huge Marxander mesh that I was talking about before to the task of designing the time domain waveform that we need to apply. Uh, but once these are applied, they are fully reconfigurable and they can be designed um, off chip. So this really transferred the complexity from fab to time domain waveform design using inverse design or any kind of gradient based optimization. And I feel that this is very interesting for uh, applications in wideband frequency translation uh, which can also be unidirectional and non-reciprocal. Uh, now, uh, we want to also take uh, small steps towards combining these synthetic frequency dimension ideas or other synthetic dimension ideas with quantum uh, sources of light. And I'm showing you two examples of collaborative work with the Lipson Gaeta groups where uh, uh, we took a micro resonator, which produces frequency correlated photons, and then sent them through a Bragg scattering four wave mixing fiber to produce complete uh, coherent interference in the frequency domain between these modes that were generated on chip. And uh, as you can see from these curves, uh, very high quality uh, interference of the Hongo Mindel kind is seen uh, just by properly tuning the pump uh, wavelengths and powers so that uh, we get 50-50 interference between these two uh, on-chip generated frequency correlated modes. The same can be done not in frequency modes, but in transverse modes. And this is again work done uh, in the Lipson group uh, where Paolo was actually also quite closely involved. Uh, and what was done here is that if you have a fat multi-mode waveguide, which supports, let's say the first order and the third order modes as well, then by designing a very precise nanoscale grating, uh, you can get very high visibility quantum interference between these modes shown by this Hongo Mandel dip. So what this really attests is to the fact that you can either generate the quantum states on chip and then interfere them off chip or vice versa, or in the most ideal scenario, you can have this complete system on chip and create very high visibility quantum inference, not just in a spatial mode beam filter, but also in frequency or transverse modes as and when required. Uh, and thinking a bit more futuristically, we can also think of uh, other degrees of freedom. For example, here we are looking at temporal modes encoded in uh, the pulses going through a fiber ring resonator. Uh, so this is a proposal for quantum computing using uh, pulses going around in the clockwise and counterclockwise directions. Um, and the goal for uh, such a proposal is that in general, we need uh, for deterministic quantum computing using quantum uh, emitters or natural atoms, we need a large number of quantum emitters that are integrated into a circuit and they might need to be coupled to these cavities in, in a strong fashion. But getting identical quantum emitters is very difficult in the solid state. Um, so what if we could instead reuse a single quantum emitter or a natural atom, whatever is easier to experimentally build and strongly couple it to a cavity and then keep on reusing this uh, single very well-built system and transfer the complexity of connectivity to the temporal mode structure that exists in this fiber ring resonator, then we could convert any uh, unitary quantum circuit uh, for performing, let's say, a quantum algorithm into sequence of instructions to the switches that route, route photons in and out of the fiber storage ring, uh, and then make them interact in a one by one fashion with this, uh, with this coherently controlled atom coupled to a cavity and implement this dual Kimball protocol, which has been around for quite some time to create these uh, controlled phase gates. So this is a way of uh, creating 
a deterministic universal digital quantum computer using very little quantum resources. And there have been some uh, advances on experimentally realizing these systems, but in the classical domain. Uh, so with that, I'd like to come to the end of my talk. And uh, I hope to have convinced you that there's quite a bit of excitement in realizing higher dimensional physics. What I showed you was limited to two dimensions, but uh, we are really excited about extending to uh, three, four, and higher dimensions using either more frequency modes or orbital angular momentum or temporal modes. Uh, it would be exciting to integrate these uh, ideas on chip using uh, several material platforms that are coming of age these days. And this can have applications in spectral manipulation or mode lock lasers or uh, novel protocols for optical uh, neural networks or quantum computing, as I was briefly mentioning. And hence, uh, I believe there's a lot of room for quantum and classical simulation of complex high dimensional funness matter physics, be it Hermitian or non Hermitian or nonlinear physics in very simple structures. Uh, and so this is possible because we can harness intrinsic properties of photons. And if we turn the tables around, we can use these ideas to manipulate these uh, intrinsic properties of uh, photons as well. Uh, in a way that is really flexible and versatile uh, and very hard to imagine in real space uh, lattices. Now, if you're more uh, interested in these ideas, uh, I'm happy to discuss. And I also like to point you to these papers where uh, we are, uh, we've detailed many of the concepts that I was talking about. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of colleagues in my postdoc group as well as the foundation that was built during my graduate school work, uh, which I alluded to in the earlier part of my talk. Um, and uh, at that point, I'd like to leave you with the summary slide and take any questions. Thank you, Avik, um, for a really impressive talk. Um, and uh, let me open for questions or comments. And Oscar will tell us if there is anything on YouTube. Marcelo. Hi, hey, Vic. Thank you very much for your presentation. Hi. Fantastic. Uh, things that you can do either in the micro scale or in going to the uh, really bulky setup. Uh, if you go to right. like page 20 where you have all the fibers and showing, <laughs> okay, it works uh, even uh, with longer, uh, in the longer case. And of course, going slower, but uh, <laughs> the principle is there. Now it's just to take all those wires and all those uh, fibers down to the chip. Fantastic. That's right, yeah. A major question that comes to my mind when I look at all those transformations and modulations that you put uh, mm -hmm. and you go down to that uh, linear transformation or the linear Hamiltonian that you presented. Mm -hmm. First, uh, it's like that when you make the modulation, you're not only populating just a pair of sidebands, but then you have uh, all the Bessel function and the, in fact, you're uh, if you go beyond a very soft modulation, you begin to populate uh, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of uh, multiple uh, frequencies. But for the quantum, right. yes. uh, you keep sort of restraining on the only the first term. Uh, how bad are the population of all the other sideband modes? Mm -hmm. And on that sense, uh, when you go to this multiplexing, uh, using the fiber grading or uh, the, the, the fiber loop for four wave mixing or the spatial transformation of your modes and making the mm -hmm. Hohmann interferometer, okay. you look pretty confined in your Hamiltonian. But when you go, go for a frequency modulation, uh, mm -hmm. I always have that conflict of seeing how much deterministic is this transfer of uh, one photon from one mode another mode in frequency. Could you comment a little bit on that? Yeah, yeah, definitely, Marcelo. That's a very good question and very much uh, pinpointing to some of the things that we need to do as the next steps. So I would say there are uh, 
two answers to your question. The first is for uh, the kind of Hamiltonian engineering or realizing Hamiltonian that we need to do. We are fine without worrying about the higher order sidebands because uh, so we can think of at the Hamiltonian level, if we had just have the first order coupling. So let's say we have cosine of omega t. If we exponentiate it to get the unitary evolution operator, that is e to the i h of t, then as an exponentiation of the cosine uh, term, we get the Bessel functions. So if to realize a Hamiltonian, we can, uh, we are actually not just implementing the Bessel functions, we are implementing the first order sidebands only. For the linear transformations, what the concern you're having is very right. Uh, and even for the frequency translation, because what you're looking at is not the Hamiltonian we are uh, implementing, but the transformation between the input of the ring and the output of the ring. And there, if you have equally spaced modes, yes, it will spread out to too many modes and uh, you won't get a very high fidelity structure. Um, so what I skipped over in that slide, just to not make it too complicated, is that we put additional small rings to uh, make a finite boundary. So if we needed, let's say, a five by five matrix, we put a small ring that has an FSR that is six times the bigger ring. And that will create a boundary every five modes uh, to confine the energy without causing any loss. It's a dispersive boundary. So anytime uh, energy goes toward that uh, mode, it gets reflected back. Um, so uh, we can also think of other ways. Let's say if we perturb the uh, cross section of the ring uh, to create sort of, let's say frequency grating, then uh, we can create a band of modes within which the frequencies are equally spaced and outside that band, the frequencies are not spaced by the same FSR. So then we don't have the problem of uh, energy leaking out because the higher order sidebands are uh, coupling too far away from the input modes. So there are ways to uh, restrict it to a finite set of modes. If you want just two modes, then uh, we will not, uh, let's say keep more than two modes within the equispace spectrum that is determined by your modulation frequency, but you're very right. We would need to do some additional structuring to make sure the higher order sidebands are not creating problems. And, and, and uh, we have a uh, paper that we're working on, hopefully uh, it will come out at some point where we are showing some of the proof of principle demonstrations of uh, sort of these boundaries or you know, preventing it go going into too many far away modes. So let's see how that works out. Thanks. Uh, other questions, comments? Natalia? Hi, Vic. Uh, Hi, are you listening to me? Yes, very I can nice hear you. To, very nice to see you today here at USP. Likewise, at least yeah. At distance, but at USP is you. Uh, <laughs> Let me ask you this. I, I want you to comment on uh, the differences between coupling light to other modes through uh, electro-optic effect. How does this compare with coupling light to other modes with nonlinear optical effects? That's my mm -hmm. question. So that's, that's also a very important question. I would say that uh, both ways, even in the electro-optic effect, we are using the chi 2 tensor of the material in most cases, lithium nibits chi 2 tensor uh, or the second order nonlinearity with a DC input field is uh, mm -hmm. the electro-optic effect, right? Um, what is different is the frequencies that we can access uh, mostly. So it, with an electro-optic modulator, I think uh, tens of gigahertz or maybe 100 gigahertz is pretty much the limit that we're hitting. With nonlinear optical effects, we need uh, more optical power, but of course, we can couple modes that are much further away. In fact, uh, what, two or uh, three terahertz is not a bad number. And I, I think I had a slide where I briefly outlined that, yeah. Let, maybe the slide will answer uh, most of your questions. So. If you're looking at uh, frequency lattice spacings that are above uh, 
maybe 100 gigahertz, we really have nonlinear optical effects as the only way we can do that. I see. I Whereas see. on the lower part of the spectrum, you can do it with electro-optic and be fine. And in terms of co coherence, uh, the electro-optic um, mechanism is better at uh, keeping the modes coupled coherently than the nonlinear. Uh, yes, you can mechanism. say in some sense for, for the nonlinear optic mechanism, either you, they would have to be uh, in some sense phase locked to each other if you want coherence for long periods of time for the mm -hmm. coupling. Uh, Electro-optic modulation usually would come from an RF synthesizer with a pretty good uh, coherence to start with. So uh, you're right. In that case, electro-optic might be a safer option to go, but I should say that the nonlinear optic of coupling we really haven't tested for a very large number of modes. So mm -hmm. uh, I cannot comment for sure, but we would probably need some phase synchronization to create those beat frequencies that will uh, cause those frequency lattices. I see. I see. All right. Thank you very much, Avik. Thanks for your question. Other questions or comments? Avik, um, let me ask you one thing. So mm -hmm. let's say I want to um, take a stream of photons and, uh, and can I deterministically shuffle them around in these temporal modes? Meaning, um, can I take say a stream of uh, uh, pairs of photons? Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm I'm getting these pairs coming one by one. Um, can okay. I distribute them deterministically among all these modes that you have access to? Uh, so I think at some point we would run into uh, concerns about unitarity because you can split and combine, but if when you do that, uh, there's an open port that's left. Is that what you're worried about, or no? Uh, I actually, I would like to shuffle, you know, shuffle these photons around actually, um, so that they come in in a certain temporal order. Mm -hmm. um, but I can uh, reorganize them if you want, and uh, and redistribute them, changing that temporal order at will. I think that should be possible with uh, optical switches. I don't see why that should be a big problem. If the, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, optical switch uh, response time is much faster than, or let's say is uh, faster than the period of the pulses, but it can be slower than the temporal width of the pulses in some sense, right? So they could be ultra short pulses. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe not even ultra short, they could be short pulses. And as long as the optical switches can route them to another path, let the other photons propagate and then put the photons back into the same ring at a later instant time, then shuffling should be possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we, I'd like to discuss this with you um, later. Oh, that would be very good. Yeah. Um, because it could be interesting for uh for work that i've i'm, I'm involved in with Bahbara Marao. so uh okay let, let's let's talk about it later uh, we have a question from youtube from uh professor kayo levenkoff who said very nice talk is it possible to study disorder effect with this setting that is the robustness of topological phases against disorder Hmm. I'm getting ex very good questions at this uh, colloquium. So, and all of them are right on point on things that we need to work on. Uh, and I, I just to put this question in a bit of context, uh, whenever we talk of topological photonics or topological physics, uh, the robustness to disorder or whether there is disorder is one of the first questions that people want to study as a signature of their topology. Um, and in real space, that disorder usually does exist. In a solid state material, you would have impurities and defects. Those are part of the uh, substrate that we start with. But in these frequency space lattices, uh, disorder is actually rare. 
Um, and the spacing between the modes, even if you take dispersion into account, is so equidistant that we uh, have almost perfect lattices to start with. So uh, if we just leave it as it is, then we don't have too much disorder effects to observe. But that being said, uh, we can definitely work a bit harder to create disorder in these lattices. One of the ways would be to break the translational symmetry and put, let's say, defects or some corrugations on the sidewalls of the ring to make sure that the modes are not equally spaced in frequency. That would create disorder. The other way would be to couple it to some additional structures, such as maybe more rings or a few waveguides to make, again, uh, mimic disorder. Uh, so if people want to study disorder, there are ways to do it. It just requires some extra work. Uh, for, the, for most of the time now, we've been focusing on the perfect happy lattices that we get for free. I think uh, Natalia has another question. No, actually, it's raised already, but uh, oh. I, I've, I've done my questions yet. Okay, you forgot to just forgot to lower your hand. Um, do we have any other questions or comments? Oscar, anything else from YouTube? Okay, well, otherwise, then uh, let's thank Avik again for a really great um, and, and very impressive talk. Your results are really amazing. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed all the questions and also this opportunity. And I hope I can keep on interacting with uh, the community at uh, USP. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, uh, wait a second. Another question of whether you control the couplings as well. So I understand the couplings between these modes from, from Caio again on, on YouTube. Sorry. So the, the question was about the disorder, right? And mm -hmm. so there's a, a follow-up whether you have control of the couplings. And I understand that um, with the electro-optic modulators, you do, right? Uh, yes, I, I, we have a lot of control over the couplings. I, to maybe think of what Kai is uh, imagining in terms of control of the couplings, um, might be thinking that uh, even if you have disorder, the signal will still cause uniform coupling in the presence of disorder. Um, so can we create disorder in the uh, couplings because the same signal is coupling across all the different frequency modes? And, and that is a question I'm not fully sure of. Um, because of the way this coupling works, we might have to think of other ways to create uh, coupling disorder. What I was thinking is more of on-site disorder in the uh, frequency locations of the rings, but disorder in the couplings might need some more thinking. I don't have a very straightforward answer to that. And okay, well, if we are towards the end of the talk, can I just uh, quickly flash this slide? Uh, so uh, as Paula mentioned, I'll be starting at uh, Maryland in January. So if anybody's interested or if you know of someone who might be interested in uh, working on research opportunities as students or postdocs, please uh, feel free to uh, connect me with them or shoot me an email. Uh, my website is up today, so uh, there should be more information if you want, or just feel free to get me in touch with me over email, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. So then, uh, Avik, thanks again. And uh, for all those who are watching or will watch this later on YouTube, um, you can see there are very interesting opportunities there. This guy is full of ideas. And uh, I should mention that, uh, uh, or, uh, maybe I should have stressed that Avik is, um, has been working since his PhD, at least in engineering departments. And um, as you could follow, a lot of his talk was on very basic fundamental physics 
um, but also, of course, having the ideas to eventually couple this to applications. And so this is really a very exciting um, kind of research. Thanks again, Avik. And um, with that, I think we can conclude the transmission. Thank you.